This week, the return of the war to where it began. Charleston. The first and only thing this week is the Battle of Charleston Harbor. While the main action of the war is in Virginia and Tennessee, Charleston holds in the public's mind because of Fort Sumter. Fort Sumter was regarded, north and south, as the citadel of the Confederacy, the Incarnation of the Rebellion, and as such, it was attacked and defended. If it were to fall, it would be a symbolic blow to the Confederacy, and symbols raise and lower morale. And there is a need to raise morale. The election of 1862 and 1863 saw a great deal of war wariness. And there are machinations. First, hardware trials. Rear Admiral Samuel F. Dupont has seven modern class ironclads and two new ironclads. First, there's the USS New Ironsides. First, the USS New Ironsides, 4.5 inch thick iron armor, 14 smooth bore Dahlgren guns, 250 pounder Dahlgren rifled cannons, and 250 pound parrot rifles. It's a threatening ship. It is thought to be untouchable. Then there is the USS Keokuk, an experimental ironclad, rotating guns housing two 11 inch Dahlgren, and its armor is 5.75 inches thick. These ships are also 7 knots and 9 knots fast respectively. It would be a shame not to try them out. The monitors are PASIC class gunboats. The Navy agrees to battle because the Army has been stepping on their toes. The Assistant Secretary of the Navy, Gustavus Vasa Fox, proposed this plan with the hope of showing off the strength of the Union's Navy to the public. General in Chief Henry Halleck, head of the Army, promised only 10,000 men to secure the gains. Perfect. It's the Navy's expedition. But DuPont is worried. Ironclads are amazing on defense, but not so much on offense. It takes five to seven minutes to repair these guns. The new Ironsides has eight guns on each of its broadsides. Their firepower is limited. He would have preferred wooden ships that can bombard, but the Navy wants a show. He plans his attack for early the 6th against General Pierre Gustave Dutant Beauregard, commanding the Confederate Department of South Carolina, Georgia, and Florida. He has two armored gunboats and the harbor's cannons, numbering 385 total. That's a lot of firepower. He also has torpedoed the harbor. DuPont is scared about torpedoes being the hidden killers of his fleet, so he contacts the creator of the monitor, John Erickson, for a new invention. A new invention that is hated by his commanders, as is a raft with an explosive charge on it, which DuPont's subordinates liken to a suicide vest. The fifth, the channel is marked by buoys. The sixth was bad weather. So on the seventh, the battle began. The first ship, is the USS Wahak, the USS we which moves at three knots, followed by the Pasiak and then Montuk. Next up is again this. Then we get to the new iron sights, three more monitors, and finally the Kriakuk. They are all moving in a slow line, and when the new iron sights has a problem, it moves out of line, which takes time. Let's see other ships behind it go, which takes time and maneuvering. And then gets back in line, which takes even more time. The rest of the line was moving when the Confederates saw the new Ironsides laying there anchored right above a 3,000 pound explosive. The Confederates switched the switch and nothing happens. The new Ironsides gets back to the battle. The Union has spent two hours closing in on the harbor, but confusion takes further hold of them. Remember how on the 5th the chain was marked? Well, the Wichak mistakes the buoys for torpedoes and swerves out of the way. A shell explodes under it, causing no damage, but assuring the captain of the vessel that he just ran into a torpedo. Fort Sumter has been laying down cannon fire onto the ships, and they move further away, trying to bombard from a distance. But it's not looking good. Their fire is not accurate, and they are suffering hits. Not serious so far, only one person has died. But the turrets are jammed. Some have to close their gun ports, and the Confederates keep it up for two hours. After two hours, Rear Admiral Dupont sounds the retreat, and the tides have turned. The Kuyukuk suffered 90 hits, 29 hits below waterline. 
that's going to be its death, but it leaves the field under its own power. It does, though, sink on the 8th off of Morris's Island. Who can we thank for the longevity of the ship? Robert Smalls, a very interesting man, most well known for capturing an entire Confederate naval vessel while enslaved by simply driving it to Union territory. Rear Admiral Dupont promises to continue the battle on the 8th, but after a meeting with the captains in a unanimous voice, he is told no. He lost one killed, the quartermaster of the Nihant, one of the more hit monitors, and 21 wounded. The Confederates lost five killed and eight wounded, but the Keokuk was lost. The guns weren't salvaged by the Union. Unfortunately, they were taken by the Confederacy. It was a strong victory for General PGT Beauregard and his Confederate Department of South Carolina, Georgia, and Florida. Then there is Major General Daniel Edgar Sickles, the Maitre de Plassars, the Maitre de Plassars for Lincoln, who has arrived. On the 6th, Sickles shows him a grand display of the corps when Princess Sam Sam gets melancholy. Lincoln reminds her of her sad German school teachers. She waits at the tent to greet the president. The troops make a fine display, but everyone's impressed by the princess's riding. I'm not kidding. Sam Sam looks at the president more. A sly humor, flickering around the corners of his big mouth and his rather small and somewhat tired looking eyes. This is getting weird, isn't it? I think it's getting weird. He rides to Sickles. General, he is a dear, good man. We want to kiss him. Would it do any harm? What? Not a bit of harm. I'm only sorry not to be in his place. Sickles tried to disarm her with that joke because everyone here is either a married man or a married woman. What the hell, princess? But that didn't stop her. With a great show, vaudevillian exuberance, she kissed the president's cheek for far too long. Lincoln recoils as his son Tad is in the room. He shows an evident discomposure, or as I would call it, shock, from Julia Butterfield, the wife of Dan Butterfield, the Army of the Potomac's chief of staff. A glance from the princess toward the ladies following in her train was all that was necessary. They quickly surrounded Mr. Lincoln, embracing and kissing him with eagerness and fervor although it was not easy for them to reach up to six foot four. If a squadron of cavalry had surrounded the president and charged right down upon him, he could not have been more helpless or more confused. Yet he smiled and laughed and seemed warmly touched by this public expression of hearty, sincere admiration and sympathy. I'd, ask, I'd add that if a squadron of cavalry had surrounded the president, he might ask to be run through at this moment. Some officers tell him Sam Sam had a bet with an officer for a fine pair of gloves. A lie, but maybe enough of a spin for the first lady, because everyone knows Tad is going to tattle. I expect Sickles to be in complete shock, because Princess Sam Sam is also married. Is this how she acts? Does Prince Felix know? Well, that's a problem for next week, because this week is over. The failure at Charleston Harbor is harsh. The Union? Well, that's a problem for next week, because this week is over. The failure at Charleston Harbor is harsh. The Union's Navy supremacy over the Confederacy is the nation's biggest surplus of power. The problem is that the strategic objectives of the war aren't at sea. The Union's blockade is important, but the Army of Northern Virginia is a land-based force. When the Navy supports an assault, it's at risk for coastal batteries. These batteries don't sink if you hit their armor. I can't stress enough how the blockade has handicapped the CSA. But that's a long game, and the Union doesn't have the patience. Will the spirits of America be reignited, or will the slow burn of the war take its toll? As I said at the start, this was part of Project Ukraine, a multi-channel collaboration covering Ukrainian history, no, mine being a Ukrainian's history throughout, well, all of time. As I said also, in my past videos, I will be donating two months of Patreon to the cause. I hope that you, if you can, you will find it in your heart to also donate.